Welcome to part three of the clinical application of VEMP tuning measurement webinar. Now we're going to look at VEMP tuning in the vestibular assessment. In part one, we did an overview of VEMP properties and reminded ourselves of, of how we can utilize those. In two, we applied VEMP tuning and measured some real life data. Now really, this is about how we would apply that VEMP tuning in the vestibular assessment. So having measured those responses and applied the normalization for EMG and then looked at amplitudes and frequency responses, where does that then fit in terms of the diagnostic um, puzzle? So, okay, in terms of clinical applications, um, VEMP has quite a broad range of clinical applications that really focus around the autolith organs. So anything from looking at the inferior vestibular nerve and superior vestibular nerve, looking at vestibular schwannomas, utricular function, saccular function, superior semicircular canal dehiscence, Meniere's disease, bilateral vestibular loss, autotoxicity, the list is almost endless. Um, so effectively anything that can affect vestibular end organ function, really we can use uh, VEMP assessment to give us some insight into much in the way we can with rotary chair, V-hit, um, chloric assessment and so forth. For this part, because we're looking at tuning, I'm going to just narrow this down a little bit for us and keep our focus really around looking at both utricular and saccular function with the O and C VEMP, but really focusing on, on two conditions that have shown the most consistent features uh, focusing on tuning. So that's uh, superior semicircular canal dehiscence, Meniere's disease, endolymphatic high drops uh, as well. Okay, so what's the literature telling us? Well, if you do a Google Scholar just for the last 10 years, uh, articles in relation to Meniere's disease or endolymphatic high drops and vent measurement, there's about 1,750 on there. So there's a lot of evidence uh, sitting uh, there that um, really probably we don't have time to dive right the way into. Superior canal dehiscence we know is a much more relatively rare condition and certainly fairly new on the diagnostic scene. So it probably doesn't surprise us that 296 articles are available on Google Scholar. If we really pare that down and, and jump into PubMed, so we've got peer-reviewed uh, articles, so much tighter um, focus. Meniere's disease, they, they have 124 on there in the last 10 years, and superior canal dehiscence about 19, so about the same sort of ratios. So we can see, as we might expect, much more vent, Meniere's and endolymphatic hand drops and vent being assessed, uh, and superior canal dehiscence uh, a little bit lower, but again, that's relative to the frequency that we might see that actually in a clinic. Okay, so we've we've spoken a little bit about tuning. So let's just go back and talk about the McHugh and Gillian study uh, that we mentioned earlier. The best frequencies and, and responses for cochlear neurons uh, and acoustically responsive irregular vestibular afferents, what we can see by their data is those vestibular afferents are what we then call a V-shaped tuning curve. So rather than a flat tuning curve like we see in the cochlea represent the basilar response, we're seeing responses that are typically uh, hinged around the 500 to 1000 hertz uh, region. And again, that really references to what we spoke about earlier, low frequency push response into the autolith organs. And typically we need to be up in normal subjects uh, around about 90 and above because we have to be stimulating at relatively high levels to create that, that pressure force going into the autolith organ. So as we said, compared to auditory fibers, uh, vestibular afferents have these high thresholds. So again, loud sounds, loud, lots of pressure putting into there with these broad V-shaped tuning curves being present. So vestibular vote myogenic potentials, um, we, we've talked a bit about frequency tuning curves. I'm going to explore that. And really that's that's traditionally now looking at what the literature has told us around the 500 hertz being the kind of pivotal point that we've looked at. Again, there are literature uh, articles coming out that we're looking at that slightly differently, and I'll delve into some of those. But certainly that's where uh, the body of evidence has looked over time. Um, into oral asymmetry ratios, comparing right and left. We're not going to talk so much about that today because really we're, we're focusing much more on the tuning properties um, of the VEMP. So let's just start with Meniere's disease then. Uh, Meniere's disease across the lifespan, um, effectively it's it's got a crossover period. So probably our three most common things, if we put aside acute things such as vestibular neuritis, uh, for example, and we just focus on some of the, the more common things we see in a typical autoneurology ENT clinic, 
Uh, BPV is always number one, and we see that with aging, so we can place that to one side. But the two that cross over really quite frequently are Meniere's disease, endolymphatic high drops, or endolymphatic changes in the in area structure, and migraine. And obviously, that's that can be a bit of a perplexing issue for us because the age range really that we often see these in clinic are the the sort of 40s to mid 60 age group and uh, it's really key for these particular um, uh, patients to and know what's causing the symptoms because obviously that affects their management plan uh, medically as well. Um, let's let's take a look at CVEMP tuning and Meniere's disease. So in this article by Rauch et al. in 2004, what we can see, we've got thresholds and amplitudes being compared both in normal ears, Meniere's disease unaffected and Meniere's disease affected. So um, uh, patients that have unilateral uh, and bilateral Meniere's disease, for example. And what we can see here is for a threshold perspective, um, very slight uh, increase in uh, uh, threshold sensitivity at one kilohertz when compared to normal groups where effectively if you look at that uh, the little circles there what we can see is in this group here you would expect to have to stimulate much higher levels to get a similar sort of response uh, from a c-vent whereas here uh, we can see that actually these responses uh, were achieving at a slightly less uh, um, acoustic uh, intensity. If we look at amplitude, uh, again, this is where a lot of the data will focus on. We'll cover this a little bit more. The size of the response. So typically, as we said in the normal population, as we can see here, the size of that response is usually hinging around the 500 hertz mark. Um, and where What we can see is in many as ears, certainly the, the response is a bit smaller. So, and again, one has to be a little bit careful with the progression of the disease. It is a bit dynamic, so that, that can cause a, a slight um, confusion in terms of how the data can sometimes present. However, what we can see is the response is a little bit smaller, but it actually increases the responses larger around the one kilohertz. So that comes back to that Taylor and Kim et al. studies earlier that we mentioned, looking at the frequency ratio between one and five, and whether the one uh, um, amplitude is large enough then to give an indicator of Meniere's disease. So again, sticking with CVEMP and, and looking at CVEMP tuning with Meniere's disease that's progressed into patients having drop attacks. And what we can see here is the frequency tuning of the, the VEMP response. This is Tim et al. in 2006. In normal subjects showed the largest thresholds that we would expect at 500. However, in many years, is the tuning was altered so that the 500 thresholds were higher. So having to put stimuli at a much louder level to get the 500 response compared with the 1000. So we had a gradient of threshold elevation, which you can see here. So again, another tuning effect being uh, described in a, in a Meniere's population that would be different to what we would expect in the norm. Now looking at cervical and ocular vent tuning, so this now is really looking at groups with Meniere's disease versus a vestibular migraine. And as we mentioned, migraine and Meniere's have this overlap. Um, there's often what we think of three groups, these migraine-associated vertigo, we've got Meniere's disease with associated migraine, uh, and then we've got migraine that, that seems to be... Um, affecting Meniere's disease or endolymphatic changes in the inner ear structure. So really having some additional information about what pathological and uh, pathophysiological process is going on is, is key often in, in which one we're managing first. What we can see here over on the left is when we look at corrected amplitude, again, in the Meniere's disease affected ear, Amplitudes are larger at 1 kilohertz versus 500, so that's consistent with the other articles we've looked at. When we look at, again, uh, frequency tuning on the OVEMP as well, what we're seeing is larger amplitudes at 1,000 uh, 1, hertz compared to 500 in those many years groups. So certainly a much um, steeper tuning than we would expect to see in a normal population, in the normal controls. Okay, so I think we've Put the case there in just those few articles there's many more but those are kind of the key ones that i i sort of gravitate towards that certainly we can see some behavioral change in the vent response in the inner ear structures moving up from from 500 to 1000 hertz when we've got some change in endolymphatic uh, properties of the inner ear structure. Now, the other one that we see frequently for VEMP, even though we've said these are 
a relatively rare condition to identify as well, is third window phenomena, so superior semicircular canal. And looking at CVEMP and OVEMP, now CVEMP, um, traditionally we have used this, and I remember doing my first recordings on superior canal dehiscence patients back in 2007, um, before we had it, you know, the ability to rectify for EMG, and we were using blood pressure cuff to sort of activate the sternocloidal mastoid muscle. And really for that, we were looking at threshold. What was the shift in threshold? That did require repeat measurements to to obviously map that out and that still is is pretty much used quite robustly today um, however if we if we look at these dehiscence patients what we can see is these peak to peak uh, corrected amplitudes have got some degree of variability in CVEMP when you compare them to the norm the range is much broader than you would expect in the norm but there are some overlaps However, some research by Janke here in 2013 and there's a couple of other articles when we look at OVEMP so getting up into the utricular system, a little probably a bit closer to the opening, the dehiscence uh, at the top of the labyrinth, we can see that, that the N10 amplitudes, and remember we said these OVEMP amplitudes are typically quite small in a normal population, 10 microvolts being very good, often over a range of 3 to 7, uh, over a range of 3 to 10 with 7 being the average. Here we're seeing some uh, measurements much broadly, uh, l much larger than would be in the norm. And we can see the differentiation uh, much clearer. And so now really we're gravitating towards using OVAMP. Um, air conducted OVAMP uh, is the main thing here because we're doing sound pressure for su superior canal dehiscence. But air conducted OVAMP measurements separating out uh, just on amplitude um, normally is from, from third window ears. And again, that means we don't have to do repetitions looking for thresholds so quite a key clinical application now again going back to looking at CVEMP because we've got a lot of CVEMP work that has been done around superior canal dehiscent looking at the different frequency properties so again in CVEMP as we've said typically we've been focusing on looking at where threshold becomes more acute so we often can measure down to 60 70 dB NHL really here what we have is a, a study by uh, Noya et al. Um, in 2018 that's actually looked at separating out these um, values and making them relative to 750 hertz. And what we can see, we've got a, a big jump in the presence of a CVEMP tuning for superior canal dehiscence um, in these populations. So particularly when we look at that relative to the healthy control. So again, that may have some uh, properties there where we can actually identify um, third window phenomena without doing repeated measurement for threshold where we do as we acknowledge have some overlap with the normal population and really look at the frequency tuning effect for for that uh, condition now one other study by manzari et al uh, 2013 actually is is quite remarkable that looked at superior canal dehiscence uh, we there conducted sound again remembering we're using the hydro mechanical force of the sound pressure to activate that third window and they in a small population but um, a significant population managed to measure um, air conducted uh, VEMP measurements all the way up to uh, 4000 hertz and we can see that tuning effect when we compare that to the norms so those are the little triangles where we can see that v-shape that inverted v-shape tuning relative to the superior canal dehiscence um, right across um, the the uh, frequency range there almost looking like a cochlear response so again quite an interesting finding um, as well so one that you know potentially uh, we can consider when we're looking at uh, some of these property changes in the structures those were all in 22 ct verified um, third window patients and they clearly had responses right up to 4000 hertz okay bringing this webinar to a close let's do a bit of a summary so within VEMP findings, we don't see any real change uh, reported for gender. So VEMP characteristics, male to female, are very, very similar. Age is possibly the one that creates a little bit more of a, a challenge for us because particularly in cervical VEMP measurements, and again, this would still really apply to ocular as well, muscular responses do decline with age. So we sometimes see a reduction in the VEMP amplitude. However, with good EMG activation, only recording when EMG activation is present and normalization, we're getting more robust responses now into the 60 to 80 year group. We just have to apply slightly different uh, methods to get that EMG activation. So rather than a seated head turn, possibly a supine head lift uh, can get us up to that. And, and again, 
the research tells us that the, the, the target EMG levels that we have been using of, of greater than 50 microvolts, proposed initially by Faith Aiken and her group, uh, sometimes can be difficult. But we can actually reduce that a little bit. We can reduce our bar so we can accept it a bit lower. Um, but also we can um, you know, normalize a little bit more for when the EMG level is up. Uh, and for shorter recordings, that becomes much more feasible than longer recordings where the muscle tires. So in terms of clinical applications, um, obviously literature is providing us with some exciting insights into the utilization of VEMP beyond the well-established asymmetry and threshold comparisons. We've talked about the key requirements to make uh, intra-subject comparisons between the frequencies and the ability to reliably normalize for EMG, uh, and in particular in that CVEMP. Uh, also makes that VEMP assessment much shorter in duration. So we've got some key features that we've talked about today that really help make that a much more robust and reliable assessment and very short as we have demonstrated. The caution that we have to approach is that VEMP as a standalone is a test that looks at one element of function uh, within that, um, that uh, physiological process. As with the other vestibular diagnostics, it's an addition to. So this doesn't take away a chloric or a V hit or any others. Um, it can be used then to broaden the understanding of inner, inner ear function, which obviously then we can correlate much more closely with the reported history from the patient and then other data that we have on inner ear function to help uh, make the medical diagnosis uh, and, and then obviously consequently make better management decisions. So in terms of clinical utility, autolith assessment, obviously, endolymphatic hydroxmania, as we've spoken about, third window things such as superior canal dehiscence. We have considered vestibular nerve involvement as well. So we know that um, inferior, superior vestibular branches are represented by CVEMP and OVEMP uh, as well. And just to bring things to a conclusion, what I would guide you towards are some further learning experiences. If you want to deep dive a little bit more into both the OVEMP, CVEMP, electoral positions and patient instructions on the Academy website, we have some great resources there for you to really broaden and supplement this, this specific webinar that we've spoken about tuning application of VEMP for. Uh, thank you for your attention.